Good morning, everyone. This is Joe Flick with the Montana State Library. Oh, I'm sorry about my slide. I, I, I must not have saved it correctly. I have the just part of it up there, um, but I'll get that fixed. Uh, we just want to get started this morning with our discussion about genrefication. So we have a panel discussion this morning, and want to um, get to our panel as quickly as we can because a lot to cover in an hour. So let me just tell you that we're going to start by um, kind of thinking about some and, and presenting some of the advantages and pitfalls of organizing books by genre in your library. More specifically in this webinar, which may be different from some other ones you may have attended or looked at uh, on this topic, is that we're going to compare different applications of this trend in different libraries, specifically a public library and school library. Um, although my public librarian is not online yet, so hopefully she will get here. We're going to compare different applications of this trend, and as I said, and then illustrate how to update your catalog record. So we're going to use the Montana Shared Catalog as an example for that, and we have our trainer from the Montana Shared Catalog online today to kind of um, quickly walk us through that process and give you an idea of what you need to be thinking about um, with your sh with your catalog, your online catalog, and how it's going to look to your patrons and what some of the back end stuff that you need to think about for that. So they'll be real practical in that respect. And then we hope that you'll walk away from this being able to better assess whether or not genrefication, which is, by the way, really hard to say, genrefication, it will be a successful strategy for increasing circulation at your library because we know that's what a lot of librarians get really excited about is some of the statistics that we've seen um, across the field for increasing circulation using uh, a different way of organizing your books. So here's our panel today. We've got um, Michelle Fenger, hopefully. She, like I said, I'm going to, as soon as I uh, finish my present, my introduction, I'm going to go see if I can find what she's, how she, why she's having trouble getting logged on. Um, but Michelle Fenger from the Public Library in Ronan, Montana. And then we have a couple of school librarians, Dana Carmichael from Whitefish, Montana, and Ann Gentry from Frenchtown, Montana. And Katie Rendy, our trainer at the Montana Shared Catalog, is part of our panel as well. So with that, Ann, I'm going to turn things over to you. Oh, I should just point out, I have one more slide. And that is just a real simple definition of what genrefication is. Um, and this photo came from a great little Pinterest board that I found, and I put the link to that in our materials section today. And if you're watching the recording for our session today, you'll find the link to that Pinterest board in the description for the video. So if you organize your a part of your library's collection by genre instead of by uh, Library of Congress or Dewey Decimal, then you are genrefication, <laughs> which even sounds more awkward than genrefication, but there you have it. So, Anne, if you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and pass things on to you. Okay. So you should have a little box on your screen that says we'd like to see your, oh yes, we see your, your um, screen now. Do you? I don't see yeah. mine. <laughs> no, it's that's the funny thing about this is it it doesn't. It's oh, here hard we go. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, we see now it. I see it. And okay. we see your presentation and your beautiful picture. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. I am Ann Gentry. I'm from the Frenchtown High School Library, and we decided after actually I think it was Diane Van Gordon who was joining us today. I saw uh, we went to a presentation last spring at the MLA. Um, the library conference, and we decided that we wanted to jump in and try it. So we have a, um, our, our, it's a junior high high school library, we have about 600 students, and we decided to go ahead and give it a go. So um, the, ba the biggest thing for us was deciding what to do, because we had limited time to do it, we decided to do it well, after the conference, which I believe was in April, maybe late March, and we needed to get it done by the time school was out. And so we had about three months to complete it if we were going to do it. So the biggest thing was devising a plan. And um, we had to decide what genres we wanted to do. And we didn't want to do too many because 
if we didn't, if it didn't work, then we were going to go back. So we wanted to make it as simple as possible. So we decided what genres we wanted and how we were going to label them. Uh, we went through the collection, which took the majority of the time, and updated everything in our cataloging system, and then we put labels on it. And then we had to map out our library and create signs. And then when all that was done, we had, I think, one day in particular, but a couple of days that we just took everything off the shelves and put it back. So that whole process took us about three months. So our first step, the, the biggest one, was deciding what genres. And we decided to go with nine, um, and I have pictures there uh, that we used. And instead of using uh, the, the sample that um, Duran used on the other one, we decided to use the actual genre stickers. Uh, we thought it was easier for us, um, and we didn't have to change a whole lot because we had already had some genre stickers on our book. So we decided what genres we're going to use. We had some sub-genres. As you can see, we had you know teen issues, humor, romance, uh, historical, which we decided to put some nonfiction books in with our genres as well because they weren't getting read in the nonfiction section. So we actually put them in the beginning of our um, genre sections. As you can see over on the right hand side, those are our stickers. That's what they look like for a realistic fiction. We had to really divide those up. Uh, we left our regular call tags on there because again if we decided we it didn't work then it would be an easy switch to go back. Uh, wouldn't harm anything, wouldn't do anything. So <clears throat> we left that. So that was to me, that was the hardest thing for us is to decide what genres. But once we did that, and once we figured out how we were going to label them, then we had to enter them um, in our system. We use Circe Dynex uh, here at Frenchtown. And most of, well, the shared catalog in Montana, they use Circe Dynex. So we went in, and our system uh, category, the item category three is a genre section. And some of the genres we used have the category there. Uh, fantasy is there, but we also divided fantasy up into subcategories, uh, supernatural being one of them. That is not one of them that is chosen. So we decided to, in the staff notes, to put any, you know, any differentiation in there. So here you can see we used supernatural. So when we're looking for books, you know, we're not sure, okay, where is this one to be found? We can go to um, workflows pull up the, the record, and we'll look under staff notes, and they'll say, oh, yeah, okay, that's, we put it in Supernatural. So it's an extra step, but it's not, it's an easy one now that we're getting used to it. And even our library aides, um, our student library aides, can, they know how to do that, and, and they can find books that we need to. Another example of that, for realistic fiction, there is not a category for that. So, and again, in the staff notes, we put realistic fiction, and then teen issues, if we had any other ones, if they're written in prose, we put a post poetry sticker. So we had everything that's on there listed in the staff notes if it's not already in category three, uh, which makes it easier for us. Uh, I am going over through this kind of quickly, but I guess if you have questions, you can ask me at the end. But I want to make sure and have time for everybody else. Oh, um, you can, don't, don't be too hurried. I still don't see Michelle, so she may have been... Um, uh, she may not be in the office or something may have come up. Oh. So take your time. And okay. I just want to add uh, to your, uh, I, I, if people could put their questions or comments in the chat box, uh, then I'll make sure that I'll bring those to your attention as we, as you, as you wind up your, your part of the presentation. Perfect. That would be great. That would be great. Um, then once we figured out how we were going to label them again, you know, and we're actually still, because we did it in such a hurry, uh, you know, we're going back through the realistic fiction right now and adding teen issues or humor or romance. We're going back through that, and we're finding that we made some mistakes or we decided, oh, maybe we don't want this one, this one. Trying to be consistent, you know, what, what constitute, let's say, supernatural. Uh, we decided that books that have vampires or werewolves, um, ESP, ghosts, anything like that, we put that in supernatural. You know, you may decide to do something else or include something else. It's, it's you know, what you decide, which is kind of nice because you, you know your readers and where they might find things or what they, how they differentiate books. So that's kind of nice to have that freedom to, 
to fix your own library up according to your readers. But once we figured out, we got all our items cataloged, uh, got their uh, genre set up in the category three item and workflows, um, we had a, a wonderful woman, um, and I've just completely spaced out her name at the moment, but she went into the Blue Cloud report and she printed up a Blue Cloud report, which is like director station. I don't know what other people are familiar with, but she gave us a list of all the books and what genre they're in. And by looking through that, we were able to get a count of how many books we had in each genre. So as you can see, you know, I had a spreadsheet and, you know, adventure, we had 135, animals, we had 59 and so on. So by knowing how many books we had in each genre, and then you can see on the right, I made a just kind of a sketchy map of our library. I counted how many books will go on each shelf, and we were able to organize or reorganize the library so we could fit our books where we needed to. And once we had a map, you know, book count, uh, created our own signs. Again, we, we didn't spend a whole lot of money because we weren't sure if this was going to work. But once we had the map done, the signs were done, then we had a, the last week of school we were closed. And so we had some students, my son and my coworkers' daughters and a friend, helped us pull all the books off the shelf. We put them in like one table, had one genre and so on. We were able to pull all those off. We put the signs up and then we were able to put them all back on um, in their new um, location. So that part actually was the easiest, I think. Um, the, the longest obviously was recataloging everything, but the hardest was coming up with the actual genres that we wanted to use. So um, that was kind of a fun day for everybody. And then this is kind of what it looks like right now. Um, you can see we have the signs. Some of them have more than one genre sticker on it. As you can, if you look at mystery on the top shelf, the mystery, the dominant genre sticker is on the bottom. So our, anybody who's putting the books away knows that's where they go is the, by the bottom sticker. And then any additional genrefication that we want to do, um, so to speak, we put on the top just to help um, readers narrow it down what they might like and what they may not. So um, as far as feedback from the students and the faculty, they love it, um, especially the students. They, they can, it's easier for them to find stuff. Um, I even had a girl who's, oh gosh, she's, she's read more books out of this library than probably any other student at this um, time, and she's finding new books that we didn't even know, you know, she didn't know existed because she, you know, likes to try different genres, so it makes it easier for her to find books. Teachers like it because they have certain lessons that they like specific books, so it makes it easier for their students to go find additional work. Um, and we've had nothing but positive feedback from everybody. And that's all I have, so I don't know if anybody has any questions. There were a couple comments and questions that came into the chat box, and um, and I think it'll make for a really interesting discussion. And Dana, I see I'm going to just leave yours till last since you're up next, and maybe um, and I'll let you just t say your own question in a second. But we have a couple here, like many books are cross genre. Mm. How do you um, how do you make the call? Is it difficult sometimes? Yeah, it is. Um, a lot of times when we, you know, like my coworker and I are like, I don't know where to put this one. We ask the students. Uh, you know, oh, we'll have okay. we have study hall in here uh, most class periods, and so we just ask them, if you had to choose this book, where would you find it, or what would you put it in? And they've helped us tremendously, and so they're the ones that are going to be looking for the books that read them. So we ask the students uh, where they would what they would put it under, and. You know, sometimes it's a flip of a coin, and um, you know, and that's about all you can do. You, and you hope that they'll find it. And if not, then you know, if you come across that book again and notice that it hasn't been checked out in a while, maybe try a different one and just switch the stickers. Lauren has a couple of so her follow-up was, "What a concept! Ask your patrons. That's great." <laughs> <laughs> um, and she also pointed out that it must be good uh, to just to sit and it really like evaluate every single book to kind of go through that process. I bet you did a little weeding along the way. It, we did. We, we're, you know, and even going through things again, 
because uh, we're doing the, like I said before, the realistic fiction, it's like, why are we keeping this book? You know, it hasn't been checked out in 10 years, and what were we thinking? Or, um, yeah, it, it's nice to get reacquainted with your collection, and, um, you know, it's, it's always a good thing. So it's, it's been a fun process, and, and we're still, like the historical fiction, we actually have a section of historical books, the nonfiction books that we put at the beginning, because there's a lot of really good novels out there that kids like, but they didn't know where to find them. So we're actually toying with the idea of putting them by time period so they're easier to find. But again, that's a process that we, we haven't jumped into yet. And that was kind of in the neighborhood of Dana's question, which I'll, we'll go to in just a second. But one other one that came up was, um, it, it was, and Jennifer uh, is looking at her picture books. So she has a little younger audience she's dealing with. Um, she's just wondering, they're really trying to figure out how to do this with their picture books. Do you have any advice for her? Um, you know, I actually saw, a, um, I don't know if it was a PowerPoint or uh, what it was about um, doing the picture books. And they just, uh, if I can remember correctly, they you know, put it by subject. Uh, it was more like if you had dinosaur picture books, they put dinosaurs, or if it was um, forest animals or something. I, uh, I don't know. They just kind of narrowed it down, and, and actually, I don't know if they used a picture for that as well on their call tag. I can't remember, but I, I, and I, I apologize. I don't remember what I was looking at, but um, I did see something. I think if you searched, just Google searched, you'd probably find some ideas out there. You, um, and Jennifer, you might check in the materials pane of today's webinar. Let's see, is, is that visible to you guys? Are you seeing the materials? You should be seeing the materials. Yes, you'll. Um, you should be able to. Uh, let me um, just pull that. Um, the Pinterest board is what I'm suggesting. Is really uh, worth maybe visiting. It was. Um, it was quite good, to, I thought, to, as some ideas for, and very, um, very visual ideas for um, how to do something. And I didn't, you might find something there related specifically to picture books. And then from Teresa, do you have to run request lists in the school setting? We are a busy public library branch. And um, she said they had over 350 items that they pulled today. <laughs> and do you know, if, you know, if your ILS would include a genre field on the request list? Um, I'm I'm going to assume that it that's probably similar to the shared catalog when we do trap holds, and you know, we definitely don't have 350 items on our list. Um, sometimes we have 30 to, you know, 10 to 30 items. Sometimes 50. Um, again, we have a, a smaller collection. We kind of, you know, know this is where it can be found. But if we not if we're not sure if we can't find things, then we um, just look at at the record and in the staff notes it says exactly where we put it. Um, Location. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe Katie might have. Do you have anything else to add to that from the way the shared catalog works? Um, yeah, there is an alternative method that I'm going to show when I present for um, changing your call number in the system to uh, reflect the genres. So um, if right. you were to use that method, then on your pick list, you would have that call number and know exactly where to go. Great. So I'm, I'm going to uh, let Dana lead on with her question and then um, make you the presenter, Dana, so if you're ready. Um, okay, so Anne, I was curious, do you blend the nonfiction and the fiction together in your um, genre? I, and some of them I do, like um, like I think of some of the adventure ones, I, I, of course I'm going blank. We, we put them with the genre, but we put them like at the beginning before the A, so they're kind of separate, but again, they're if someone goes to, mostly I, we put like historical sections, so it includes both like Unbroken or Night, you know, those novels, um, but then we have so historical they, fiction. So we have them in the same location, but the, you know, the nonfiction starts off the section. Okay. Hmm. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lot to wrap my head around. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so um, I only did one slide, <clears throat> and um, when Joe, when I asked Joe Flick about a genre presentation, um, it's because I haven't done it. And so she thought it might be interesting for me to talk about why I have resisted the call to arms for reorganizing a library into genre classifications. And um, one of the things that I inherited when I got the school library here in Whitefish was the Accelerated Reader program. And quickly on those heels, um, all the teachers wanted to know Lexile levels. And I just decided um, that I prefer not to have a lot of stickers on my spine labels. So I try, when at all possible, to only have the spine label on the spine of the book before I cover it and put it on the shelf for the kids. Um, and I know that's just a personal preference, um, but I, I, I just don't. <laughs> I called myself a processing minimalist. I guess that's the most accurate way I look at the way I process the books. Um, I have also worked really hard to push the kids toward the school catalog. We use uh, Fall at Destiny in our library, and I put everything I can into the catalog about the books. So if, for example, um, the book Chasing Orion by Catherine Lasky, if I know that there's information on the internet about polio, I might add little links to the catalog records so kids can click on it and learn more about polio as they're reading or before or after they're reading the novel. Um, I, I also want the kids to be thinking about stretching their genre interest. And one of the things I've noticed being a middle school librarian is I'll have kids that will only read graphic novels. And they will read every graphic novel in the library. And then they'll go back and reread them two or three times. But after their third reading of them, I can usually say, well, is there anything else on the shelf that looks interesting to you? And you know, maybe we need to push past the graphic novel and that we need a varied, a well-balanced book diet in our lives. Um, so I've, I've been a little hesitant to put it in genres just because I didn't want the kids to get stuck in a rut. And I, and I also have a little hesitation because um, I don't want any kid to get labeled. And their privacy in what they're reading is as important to me as having a variety of books that they check out. So for example, I had a sixth grade boy that was really struggling to find anything to read. And he checked out a Kindle and asked me privately if there were any romance books that I would recommend to him. And I said, well, of course there are. So um, I, I don't know if anybody who's made the switch has noticed problems in that area, but I've just wondered if if that could be a problem. Um, the other thing, and I, I noticed when Ann was talking, and I've talked to Susie Crosby in Columbia Falls High School as well, that a lot of people leave the old spine labels in place in case the person who follows them wants to put the library back in traditional order. Um, so I guess I was looking at it more in terms of the library is going to outlast me and if I make this change, am I creating a nightmare scenario for the person who comes after me? Um, one of the things on my list is trigger warnings. And I put that on there because I've started getting more and more questions about, well, did you know that this book has a kid that's cutting? <laughs> and I'm, I'm worried that with the trend in colleges going toward trigger warnings for lectures, trigger warnings for textbooks. You know, if, if I'm genre classified and I'm putting stickers on all my spines, am I going to also have to put trigger warnings in the front cover of the books? But that may be something that never comes to pass. Um, and then the last reason that I have resisted the change is um, 
this is my 20th year teaching middle school kids, and I'm coming to realize that maybe it's my personal bias that kids would get stuck in a rut and um, that kids who need a high-low reader might be embarrassed to go to that section. So I'm curious to know what anyone else has noticed, if anything, on my list of concerns. So I, what do you think? I can, answer, I can answer some of those. This is Anne. Mm -hmm. um, I have noticed as far as, of course, high school is different than middle school. I think they're a little more sensitive to what they read and, and what other people think about them. But I think some of our genres that have never gotten read have gone up. Westerns, for example. Nobody read Westerns, and now we have a lot of kids that are reading them that didn't even know they were there, um, which has been kind of fun. And kind of for the trigger warnings, what, what we have, and it's very subtle, um, because there are some high school books that definitely are not as appropriate for junior high kids, we just put a blue sticker at the top of the spine, and that, and that you know, we when that comes up, it's like, oh, you know, you might want to try a different book, or we call their parents and get permission. Um, is what we do. But again, we have a smaller collection, so it's easier for us to do that. And you're junior high and high school combined? We are. Okay. Thanks. And I wanted, I know, I, I noticed that Chani, uh, um, your colleague, also got to, finally got to join this morning. So Chani, if you have anything else you want to add in, uh, feel free. But I, I really thought this was, um, when Dana and I talked about it, I thought this, a, a lot of, um, a lot of times these kinds of trends, you know, you don't really think through the pitfalls. And so some of these things are really, I think, worth at least, you know, having a discussion about in your library and, um, you know, noodling around a bit. So let's see, we do have, um, we didn't have any questions or comments come in with Dana's presentation. And I think I'm going to turn things over to Katie now. Katie, if you're ready. Um, okay, yep. There you are. Let's see here. All right, are you and seeing my screen? I'm oh, waiting. There we go. Yep, there it is. All right, so I am going to talk a little bit about how you can switch to a genrefication um, shelf location system in the Montana Shared Catalog. Uh, Ann mentioned earlier the Montana Shared Catalog uses Circe Dynex Symphony. Um, and this is actually what I'm going to show you is a different way than what than how Ann organized her collection in the system. This, um, what I'm going to talk about is how you would organize uh, by call number. So in our system, the call number is what tells you the shelf location of an item, and it's a free text field. So um, this is where you'll decide as a library what naming conventions you want for your collection and apply them. So of course, you have to think about your audience as well and keep it concise, but you can use any call number format that you want. And there are a couple of suggestions on this slide. For example, um, this fiction, I'm gonna use the laser pointer here. Um, this F-SCI, that would be maybe like a science fiction and then the author's last name, or um, you could do the full FIC, SCI and the author's last name. There's no need for a dash, it's just personal preference. Um, and then as far as your item cats, um, and since she wanted to use genrefication in her library, uh, but not really commit to it in the system very, very wholly like using the call number, uh, she used item cat three as her uh, subject list. And then because we can't add very many subjects to the item cat three, she had to use the staff notes to do um, additional sub genres or uh, mark genres that are um, not in the item cat three. Uh, so if you use the call number to mark your genre, uh, you would not have to use that item cat three. So we have five categories in our system. Um, the first one is the format. So most people would use either book or paperback or hardcover for the type of book. Um, item cat two would be the department, adult, juvenile, YA, or easy. Um, and then item cat threes is where 
is where Anne was using her genres. Um, and we recommend using the call number if you can, because these item cats are supposed to kind of stay the same over the long term. They are how we pull long term statistics for checkouts in your library. So it, using an item cat like the item cat three, what our concerns are is that genres might change over time. Like if you're reassessing your library and redeciding where items might need to go, um, something like maybe um, what was called goth in the 1990s is now called emo. So you would have to make those changes in your item cat three so that your students could still find the items. But then that would make your long-term statistics not very useful for you because you had to make that change. Uh, we can still pull statistics on the call number. We can pull statistics on your um, like F-SCI call number if, if you need to. It's, um, it's really easy. So it doesn't limit the way that you can pull statistics on your collection, um, but it does kind of add to your long-term statistics. Let's go forward here. There we go. Um, so a couple of examples of libraries who are using this way of organizing their their catalog. Um, we have uh, Baker High School up here. I think Diane is here. Um, you can see they're kind of different between the two schools that we have um, organized this way or the two schools that I chose to, to feature here. Um, the call numbers are just a personal choice here, like I said before. So it looks like Baker High School chose to do the full FIC and then a space and then their um, genre is the next sort of their genre, you know, abbreviation. And then they use the full author's last name. So that makes for kind of a long call number. Um, again, not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a personal preference. Um, and then Park High School has a much shorter call number. They just did F for fiction, dash, and then the genre, and then the first three letters of the author's last name. So um, that makes for a shorter call number, just a, just a preference. Um, both of these libraries use a home location of fiction. Your home location could be um, nonfiction if you were going to include both of those, um, both of those groups in your genre fiction scheme or stacks. Some people use stacks. Um, and then you can see how they use the item cats different in the two libraries. So again, this would just be preference. You, you would probably want to try to keep these the same if you were going to switch your library over as what you are using right now, again, for those long-term statistics. So um, like Baker's using the item cat one and two, whereas Park High School is just using the item cat three uh, for that part. And then Diane shared with me their, her genre list. Uh, you can see here, uh, it looks like they chose 22 genres. Um, and the abbreviations run anywhere from one letter to four letters. And she did tell so me... Is, are, oh. are the abbreviations under genre, is that standard? Um, that you want to keep preference? them, you know, you want to keep them standard in your, in your system, you know, choose them, write them down. But um, no, I think these are just, these are just made up. Like the science fiction that Diane chose is SF. Um, but you could definitely choose SCI instead. I've seen that. So, okay. Um, so yeah, I think these are just just personal choice. Maybe just looking on the internet and seeing what other people um, chose. And then, oh, oh yeah, Diane did share with me that she, if she were to do this again, she would choose no more than 15 cal categories. Right now, she has 22. Um, and a couple that she would get rid of was the short stories and the novel inverse. And I think that. Um, if she's here, if she wants to chat a little bit more later about uh, what what else she might cut from that, that would be fine. And then you as know, far as how, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say the other question that's come up was that, you know, Mark Records have genre fields and um, how do those kind of play into the um, right. catalog entry? Right, so I'm definitely gonna get to that. Okay. Um, Looking at your catalog, your online catalog, I've got just a screenshot here of Baker's online catalog. And um, there are two ways that you can search the catalog by genre. The first way is if you've already changed to the genrefication, you can have your students choose to search by genre through the catalog 
by typing in the beginning of the call number of that genre. And I think to be able to do this, you would have to have like a little laminated cheat sheet or something next to the computer uh, so the students know exactly what to search. Um, but in this way, like at Baker High School, um, if you just typed in FIC space and then the abbreviation for that genre, you will get a list of items in the library that have that call number as the beginning. Um, and then you could organize, you know, reorganize by publication date or any of the left-hand limiters. The other way is by searching the subject. So the subject down here is pulled from the MARC record, like you said. So it's pulled from um, the 650 tag. And um, this will also give you similar subjects to maybe what you choose as genreification. But by searching this way, you'll get all sorts of items, not just, say, your fiction collection that you chose to organize by genre. Um, so in this case, like if you were to choose science fiction, um, you would also get, to limit it by science fiction, you would also get uh, like maybe movies on science fiction if you have those in your collection. Or um, if you have your graphic novels in a different place, you'd get the graphic novels or you'd get um, your nonfiction books, which sounds a little strange for the science fiction example, but um, but like if you had westerns as an example, you would get your nonfiction westerns doing it that way. So that's how the mark tag comes in. And that is what I have for you. I can show you um, the workflows mark tag if you think that's helpful or um, or do I have any questions? Let's wait a second and see what other questions come in. And we're actually, we're going to be um, ending up a little early here. So any other okay. questions or comments? And I apologize that our uh, third present presenter didn't get logged on this morning. I didn't hear back from her. I just checked my email. So assuming that something came up or she has the wrong day on her calendar, stuff happens. I'm going to go ahead and... Um, Oh, that's good. Great. You want to bring that up? Go ahead, Katie. Uh, yeah. This is the, um, the mark tag. So the subject terms are your 650s, and you can see we've got science fiction, we've got space stations. So you're going to have a lot more categories in your mark tag uh, that students can search using um, those subject limiters. So one of the things that came up earlier was, um, and, and I think it was um, Anne that mentioned, that using Blue Cloud, the analytics in Circe Dynex to mm -hmm. kind of start the process or assist in the process. So um, do you, is there anything else you want to say about, about that or? Um, yeah, we are going to be uh, teaching Blue Cloud analytics coming up in the spring. Um, so we can show you uh, how to create lists, lists like the one that Anne used. Um, and we can also create those for you. So if there is a list of items like like the one that Ann had that you would like us to create for you before we roll out BCA, or um, if you just um, can't figure out how to do it, we're happy to do that for you. One of the services of being a Shared Catalog member. And those of you who are joining, who are joining us from other states, um, yeah, the Blue Cloud Analytics is part of the Circe Dynex system. So. Um, I'm sure um, other library systems have other versions, so um, something to look into. And uh, I th with that, I just think I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording, but we'll keep our panel online here for a bit to have uh, further discussion if anyone has specific questions they want to ask. Basically, I've been wanting to do something like this for quite a long time, and so... Um, we just started asking a lot of questions and talking to our patrons to see if that was something they thought was a good idea, and they did. So, um, and it fell right into line with our Smart Spaces grant and the Summer Leadership Institute. And um, then I attended PNLA right after Summer Leadership, and I went to a session there, um, a library in Canada had done it with their nonfiction section. Very inspirational session, and um, I put a link to 
his uh, PowerPoint presentation that he did, in case you're thinking about doing nonfiction. <laughs> but the whole time I sat there thinking about it, I'm like, I want to do the children's books. So when I got back, I spent a lot of time researching different options, how to begin, and uh, I finally chose the Metis, which I've got lots of links to there. Um, the other big thing is getting staff buy-in for it because it is a lot of work. <laughs> uh, so what we started doing is we, we went through the Metis information. Actually, let me go back real quick here. If you go to this first site, um, they have a nice little download. That Oh, look, and there it is already open on my tab. <laughs> uh, this Metis schedules download. It's lots and lots of pages, but it gives you great ideas and tells kind of how they came up with it. They're an elementary school library. Um, these are kind of their main categories. They chose 26 of them. And what we did is we just used that as a guide. We did not um, follow it to a T because it wasn't perfect for us. So we started, as you can see in the bottom picture, sorting books into potential categories. Um, one of the things you want to do is make sure you put labels on your piles, otherwise you start forgetting what's what. <laughs> um, at first, the person that I had changing the records in our system, which we are not on shared catalog, she was doing each book individually. And so we finally figured out how to batch at it because all we're changing are the call numbers on them. And what we're doing is we picked a main category such as ourselves and then different subcategories. So for example, we have ourselves families, ourselves uh, health, ourselves life events, which that one took us a long time to figure out because we couldn't figure out where to do like death and divorce and those hard to talk about things and we wanted to have something that didn't seem like negative connotations for it, you know? <laughs> um, and we discussed a lot of it with our patrons. We're still discussing it with our patrons. And just so you all know, we're still in this process. <laughs> um, keep lots of notes of decisions you make, like ourselves life events. It took us so long to come up with it that we have it written down in about 25 different places. <laughs> Uh, one of my staff members uh, is not that familiar with children's books, so I thought it was really funny when uh, he wrote down for me that there's a lot of books and skinny books equal less space, which means more books, um, which is kind of funny because I, I mean, I knew that, but I, sorry, I just realized I was blocking my pictures. But the way we are now organizing those books is through our Smart Spaces grant we are having custom bookshelves made where all of our books will be faced, all the children's books will be faced forward. Um, we do have one bookshelf in here already that we have on display with books in it and then the rest of them are being finished up this weekend which we're looking very forward to because whoops, one of the pitfalls, I see I covered words too, I'll fix that. <laughs> uh, one of the pitfalls is not having the shelves already here for when we're finishing books. So up in the top right corner, that picture is, you know, we're using the old shelves for books that have been redone and as you see, kind of doing bins and piles. Um, the, the bottom left is what our new bookshelves, well, that one's not quite completely done because they're on the front of each bin on them. They're going to have, uh, we're going to paint it with chalkboard paint so that we can label exactly what is in that bin. And then if we're, you know, moving books around, it's not going to be such a problem uh, changing the labels. Uh, another thing is space is a huge pitfall. Um, we are laying everything all over the place because we're such a small library. So it takes up a lot of the space that is normally used for patrons. Like all of our tables are covered with piles of books. 
on the same hand, patrons can see the process, but it does cause sometimes our piles getting messed up and us having to redo them. Uh, we're learning, like I said, that there's lots of children's books. Uh, we probably should have had a, a more thorough plan of action written down before we started. <laughs> um, brainstorming categories together is much more effective than one of us coming up with them um, because for two reasons. Other people think of things that you don't. Um, the other is that we feed off of each other when we start spouting out different things. So, And uh, it takes a lot of time and space. And rolling tables, which are another thing we got through our Smart Spaces grant, are fantastic for this project because we can pile stuff on and move the tables around instead of having to move the piles around. And that that's it for my little slideshow. <laughs> Thanks. Um, one comment came in that um, apparently there's such a thing as chalkboard paint contact paper. So, um, oh, really? Yeah. Well, I also I found I have been playing with. I'm totally into that kind of stuff. I've been playing with recipes, and you can make your own chalkboard paint with latex paint and unsanded grout, which is not very expensive at all. So I didn't know about the contact paper, though. I'll have to look into that. It, uh, just the whole idea of making a, a label out of that you can just rewrite very easily and is fun. Yeah. Um, of course, you do have to worry then that kids will come through and rewrite them for you. But <laughs> well, one of the things we're going to do is I'm using um, the liquid chalk because oh. once they dry, which doesn't take very long, uh, you have to use wet to wipe it off. Ah, uh, okay. So they can't just do it with their fingers yeah. or their sleeve. Yeah. Exactly. Well, oh, thank you. I'm, again, I'm going to stop our recording, and I'm glad you got here, Michelle, because I think this is... Oh, good. thank you. Oh, Somebody I had see. a question about picture books, so that was... And I see there, what do your new call numbers look like? So, like we have animals is a main category, and then you've got dogs, bears, cats that kind of thing. Uh, technology is a main category and under that we've got coding and robots and computers and you know of course now I'm drawing a blank on all of our categories but um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe put your, we'll have you put your um, email into the chat box so that person can oh, contact you directly. Certainly. And, and yes. one other question came in is how deep are those forward-facing shelves that you have, that blue shelf that you have there? Uh, deep. deep. They are about eight inches. Um, well, like from the bottom of the shelf to the little top where you can see the book above, that's about eight inches. As far as front to back deep, they are 36 inches, I believe. I, I can get all those measurements for you, too. Um, one of the things we are changing, we built one first to see how we liked it, because we I got inspiration off of a website, of course, but it was only a little two-layer, and we wanted a top on ours to be able to display fun stuff, so we kind of drew our own design, and that's what's in, in the picture. Um, one of the things we did decide to change right now, there's just three bins on each shelf. We're going to have adjustable dividers so there can be three or four bins. Because uh, in the picture, you can see there's a lot of wasted space in there. <laughs> yeah, it might be good to have that be like, yeah, adjustable makes sense. Yeah. And you can access this from either side, so it can kind of be freestanding. Correct. That, yeah, not and they're just also all on casters which uh -huh. makes it really easy to move around. I mean, I can move a loaded bookshelf by myself. Ah, good. You know, it's not super, super easy. It's a little awkward, but I can do it if I need to. You know, two of us, it's great. And then there's a question about how many categories do you have? Uh, right. I mean, just ballpark. We're doc talking several dozen? Oh, yeah, we're at about 25, I believe. So, our, that's good. You know, yeah. 
Well, I'm going to go ahead and st we are at 11.01 and we did start a little bit late, so I'm going to stop our recording. Thanks everybody who's tuned in. If you're watching the recording, be sure to check out the description and uh, there'll be information and links in the, in the description for today's recording.